Good morning, everyone, everywhere, and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. As we prepare for worship today, print out or pull up your worship guide, light a candle as a reminder of the light of Christ that connects us no matter where we are, and take a deep breath and remember that you are on holy ground. In this series, we honor that great cloud of witnesses that came before us, both in our own lives and in our families of faith. We also acknowledge the ancestors of the land on which we dwell and pray that the indigenous people who survived to steward this land for millennia continue to thrive into the future. The Alaska United Methodist Conference is 164 years old. We have churches from Nome to Unalaska, all across South Central, the Kenai Peninsula, and down the Panhandle. Our churches sit on the land of the Inupiaq, Yupik, Tanana, Koyukon, Denina, Clinket, Aleutic, Aleut, and other indigenous peoples. With all the best intentions, Methodists came to Alaska to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we know that intentions are different than impacts. And some of the impacts of missionary work in Alaska have been tragic for the Native people. As the Alaska Conference moves into its new iteration as a mission district, let us commit ourselves to reconsidering what mission looks like. So rather than being colonial, mission is an invitation into a relationship with Jesus and his body, the church. Let us repent of any harm that was done and instead work for the healing and abundant life of all people. And let us be thankful for the indigenous peoples across the state of Alaska, past, present, and future, who steward this land. Let us pray. Thank you, God for ancestors, the ancestors of this land, the ancestors of our families, and the ancestors of our faith. We are grateful for their lives and their sacrifices, and we are joyful that they surround us even today as a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on as we run this race. May we learn how to live wisely from their examples, their dedication, their faith, and their lives. Amen. Let us raise our voices together in song as we sing, Abide With Me.
final female ancestor named in Jesus's family tree is not a paternal relative, but his mother, Mary. With Advent and Christmas coming, we know we'll hear lots more about Mary. But remember that Mary was a young woman, maybe even a teenager, engaged to be married to Joseph when an angel came to her to tell her she would bear a special child, the Son of God. We can only imagine how shocking and frightening that news was. But Mary responded with trust and faith. And then she raised her voice in a song of praise. This is the Magnificat, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Do you remember our ancestor math from the first week of our series? Remember, if we only count biologicals, you have two parents. And each of your two parents have two parents, so you have four grandparents. And those four have two parents, so you have eight great-grandparents. And those eight have two parents, so you have 16 great-great-grandparents. And each of them have two parents, so you have 32 great-great-great-grandparents. Our personal family trees quickly branch out into a whole forest full of grandparents and aunts and uncles and second cousins once removed. In our original scripture for this series, Jesus' genealogy, we see not just two or three generations, but 14 generations between Jesus and the deportation to Babylon. That 14th great-grandfather, Josiah, was only one of Jesus' 16,376 14th great-grandparents. There were another 14 generations, and we find Jesus' 28th great-grandfather, David, doubling that number of grandparents again. And as we continue to trace back through Jesus' genealogy, we get to his 42nd great-grandfather, Abraham, one of almost 50,000 grandparents in Jesus' family tree. Among all of these dozens upon dozens of generations, a few names jumped out at us as familiar. And we saw tucked in among those paternal relatives a few anomalies, the names of some of the women in Jesus's family tree. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, the wife of Uriah, whom we know is Bathsheba, and Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus.
In our, if our story last week was a story about Bathsheba being impregnated without her consent, then this week's story is one of enthusiastic consent. The angel visits Mary, calling her favored and telling her that she has been chosen by God to bear a special child, God's son. And instead of running away screaming, Mary responds to the angel with interest and curiosity. Even though she was innocent, she obviously knew about the birds and the bees because she questions the angel and says, how is that going to happen? The angel explains how this miraculous conception will occur and then breaks the news of another miracle that her cousin Elizabeth, who was thought to be barren, was also pregnant, showing that God can make a way where there is no way. And Mary responds to the angel with enthusiastic consent, saying, here am I, servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Here I am. This was not just a birth announcement. This was the calling of a prophet. Think back to Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Samuel, Isaiah, all the prophets who were called by God, who answered saying, here I am. Mary joins the ranks of those prophets, those special few called to speak truth to power, and bring good news to the poor. And that's exactly what Mary does. The next words that scripture records Mary saying are the ones that we call the Magnificat. Mary's song of praise as she cries out, my soul magnifies the Lord. Mary goes on to prophesy the way the Lord will bring down the mighty and raise up the lowly, how he will have mercy on all who fear him, all who regard him with awe and wonder. Mary prophesies food for the hungry and humility for the rich. Mary's powerful words of prophecy are echoed many years later in one of Jesus' sermons that we call the Beatitudes, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are those who grieve, and woe to the rich who are full. Where did Jesus learn this powerful preaching and prophecy? Maybe at the knee of his mother, the prophet Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, raised him to be a good Jewish man, observing all the feasts and festivals. Mary wrapped him up tight and fled to Egypt when Herod threatened to kill him. Mary went back to Jerusalem to find him when Jesus stayed behind in his father's house. Mary was there when he preached in his own hometown for the first time and almost got thrown off a cliff. Mary was one of the women who followed Jesus through his ministry, providing him food and support. And Mary was there at the foot of the cross to see her son crucified. Mary, the prophet, whom Jesus tr God trusted to raise Jesus the Savior. If you wanna get nitpicky, you could maybe argue that Jesus's family tree is very small. Mary, his mother, and God, his father. But that's not the way our ancestors in the faith tell Jesus's story. Through his stepfather, Joseph, Jesus is of the line of David, the Messiah who was foretold, the one who was to come as a savior, the product of the love of thousands. Jesus' story helps us make sense of all of those stories that came before. Rahab and Ruth were outsiders, and it is Jesus who continually crosses barriers to meet people where they are and bring them into the family. 
Tamar and Bathsheba were injured by systems of power. And it is Jesus who turns the tables and rejects the powers of this world. Judah and David did not behave honorably. And it's Jesus who obeys not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of it as well. David abused his power. And it's Jesus who poured himself out to give his merciful, loving, healing power to the whole world. Jesus transformed his family line, redeeming their sins and exemplifying a whole new way to live. In this series, we've met some of Jesus's ancestors and our own ancestors in the faith. We've seen people at their best and at their worst. And through it all, we've seen how God works blessings time and time again, even out of the darkest situations and the toughest times. I also invited you in this series to reflect on your own ancestors by blood and birth or by chance and choice and remember what they taught you. And I reminded you to open up your spiritual imagination to the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds you always, cheering you on towards victory in this race that you run. Linda Hogan, is the Chickasaw Nation's writer in residence. In her book, Dwellings, A Spiritual History of the Living World, she writes this. Walking, I am listening to a deeper way. Suddenly all of my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. I thank God for all our ancestors and for all of you, the living saints of the church. Amen. I'm Shawnee Olson, and these are my parents, Lillian and David Jeffries. I am grateful for my ancestors. My parents were pillars of their community, but more importantly, they were pillars of their church. When there was a national merger between the Methodists and the Evangelical United Brethren, my dad was instrumental in making this happen in our small town of Center Hall, Pennsylvania. My dad led the congregational singing, and he started a men's chorus that sang countywide. When anybody wanted anything done at the church, they always called Dave. My mother was on the other side of the church in the primary department. She was chair of the primary department for years and years. Her flannel graph stories made Bible stories come alive. To this day, those of us that had the opportunity to hear her teach still remember them. She also started a group called the Sunshine Choir, and we got to lift our little voices all over the county singing in this little group. It was a wonderful experience growing up in the church that they loved so much. My parents were kind and compassionate people. 
They couldn't do enough for others. They were always there, ready to help, willingly volunteering to do anything that needed to be done. I remember a house full of love, a house full of support, a house where I was not only cared for, but others were cared for as well. My brother and I grew up knowing what it was like to be children of parents that cared about each other. They loved their three grandchildren and later in life welcomed the two little grandsons they got to know before they passed. One of my fondest memories of them is walking past their bedroom late at night and seeing them both on their knees, praying to the God they loved so much. I have spent my life trying to be as much like them as possible. Thank you, God, for David and Lillian Jeffries, my parents. Please pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your continued generosity and your donations of your tithes and your offerings. Keep an eye on the newsletter for some upcoming special giving opportunities, including United Methodist Student Sunday and gifts for students in need around our community. If you'd like to make a donation to support the missions and ministries of the church, please visit the online giving portal through our website or send a check to the street address that you see on the screen. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. As we go forth today for the last time of this series, I offer you this benediction. May God, who has given us in the lives of the saints patterns for holy living, strengthen your trust and devotion so that you may live faithfully through all things. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Thank you.